Hi everyone, I'm here today at the University of Sydney uh, with my friend Peter who is a PhD student in physics education. Hello, I'll hello. Let him explain what he does. Hi, so I, I'm a PhD student in physics education and uh, my research is uh, focused on figuring out how to make better physics education multimedia, also known as I try to figure out how YouTube works but end up not making any. <laughs> Yeah, so you've done a little bit of work with like analyzing YouTube videos? Yeah, so I, uh, my, my supervisor uh, actually was also the supervisor of a certain Derek Muller of Veritasium fame. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Dirk from Veristablium fame. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, that's actually how I heard of the, the, the program over at UCID and that's why I came over from Perth uh, to start my PhD. And yeah, I'm, I'm studying how to not just create uh, videos that teach concepts in physics, but also encourage, I don't know, reflective thinking, or critical thinking, and uh, looking into facts and checking if they're legitimate or not, and those kind of things. Hmm. So. so I thought we'd talk about something that is related to learning physics, and that is the idea of thinking like a physicist. Mm. Um, so it's something that I've sort of heard along my physics education is that um, what people are trying to teach you is not just, you know, to memorize facts about mechanics or certain physical systems, but to think in a way that a physicist would. Mm. So what does that statement mean to you? So for me, it kind of like um, encapsulates the whole idea that science is not a collection of facts. It's not an encyclopedia. It's a way, it's a systematic way of looking at the world and trying to understand how it works. Um, so for, for me, it's uh, like as a, as a person that's been trained, hopefully relatively well, to think like a physicist, it means that I get good at estimating things and checking um, like dimensions, right? Dimensional analysis mm. and uh, just kind of going, is this a reasonable number? Um, yeah, I think in the end, when you come out of your physics degree, like physics is such a broad discipline, you could never learn all of it, but if you can learn to think in this way, then at least you can tackle and approach these ideas on your own. So I know I've been involved in tutoring a course that um, has a focus on estimation. So we give the students um, the problem of how many piano tuners are there in this city. And at first when you hear that, it might seem a bit overwhelming. You're like, I don't know. Um, but if you can start from something that you do know, maybe an estimate of the population, maybe an estimate of how many people would have pianos, you can work from there and get something that mm. seems reasonable. Mm. Uh, so basically the, the kind of the class of these kind of estimation problems is called Fermi problems after the, the Italian physicist, the Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Enrico Fermi. And there's actually a fascinating book about him called The Pope of Physics, which I recommend everyone should check out on audible.com, <laughs> which is... Not sponsored. Not, not just yet, not just yet. Um, but uh, there, there's an amazing story about him when he worked on the Manhattan Project, where all the scientists were trying to figure out like the yield of the, 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 the Trinity test, like how big was this explosion going to be in you know, um, kilograms of TNT. Right, and everyone was kind of having like this discussion, and they were doing all these mathematical cal calculations. And one of the things that Fermi did was, during the explosion, he held up a piece of paper, and he tore it into a smaller piece, and he held it up in the air, and he dropped it. And the instead of dropping straight down, it because of the shock wave, it dropped sideways. And he, you know, measured out the number of paces, and you know, in his mind, did a quick calculation, did a quick estimation and was able to get within a factor of two, right? Mm. Which is really cool that you can measure the yield of an atomic bomb with a piece of paper. Yeah, I think when you do something like that, order of magnitudes are all that matter. Like if something's 87, mm. just round it to 100. And the same as like if something's four, that's actually closer to 10, just use 10. Like yeah. numbers like that make it a lot easier. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Oh, so many engineers are gonna laugh at us. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's like this other thing that we uh, are taught as physicists is not to kind of, it's not just to kind of blindly believe things, right? Like if someone tells you a fact, your brain should light up and go, where did they get this fact mm. from? How was the research conducted? Who's paying for it, right? Yeah. Like what are the kind of biases in that? And then the other thing is like, try not to fool yourself. There's that Feynman quote of, 
You know, science is about trying not to fool yourself, and you're the easiest person to fool. And uh, sorry to make this into a book recommendation <laughs> no, give us a uh, book, uh, but if you haven't read Thinking Fast and Slow mm, by... Yeah, no, I could recommend that one as well. <laughs> brilliant! Such a good book. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think some of those like estimation type problems too, like they're not unique to physics. It's, it's thinking critically in general, and of course it applies to lots of fields. I've heard um, people say that like the questions they ask you at Google interviews are like this. They're sort of absurd mm. sounding estimations, but once you boil it down to like a few steps um, and make a few assumptions, you can actually think quite critically about a lot of um, things in the world around us. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'll post a link to Peter's Twitter down in the bio and anything else he works on so you can check him out there. Yeah, cool. All right, thanks for watching. Thank you very much.